So we can go one step further though, and we can use this now to calculate the energies of the Bohr atom and the energies of the, of the energy levels. Now that we know what that fundamental radius is, and then we can predict, by the way, the radii of consequent uh, uh, energy levels. Um, so let's go ahead and actually calculate the energy levels of this. Um, now what we're gonna do is we're going to try to calculate the classical energies of this quantum system. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do here, the, we're gonna end up using, uh, um, we're gonna determine the kinetic energy of the electron. And so just a, as a, as a uh, dumb person reminder, the kinetic energy is always given as one half mv squared. So um, it, as we've already determined, we do have an expression for v squared. And sorry, I, I don't mean to say the dumb person uh, version of kinetic energy, but I mean really, if you've gotten this far and if you don't know that, you haven't actually gotten this far. So anyway, the point is that we, have, we, we can determine the kinetic energy of the electron and really, I mean, that, that's, that's what we want to use here. So if we have the kinetic energy of the electron in terms of V squared, let's go back and consider what our, our calculations were for V squared in the first place. And so we had determined that the velocity, hey Len, what are you doing, bud? All right, I gotta pause for my dog. So um, from the, the um, de Broglie's hypothesis, we had determined that, and, and combined with the energy levels, this was n h bar over, um, what was it, m, yeah, yeah, from angular momentum, m e times r sub n. And again, I'm gonna allow for n to be any natural number here. And we had also independently determined that um, we can write r sub n as n squared times a naught. That's, that's what this equation here is. And so pretty clearly there's, there's a nice little cancellation there. And so we can now describe the velocity in terms of h bar over me and, uh, you know, and I'm going to rearrange this slightly because it's almost always useful to bring that n out because everything else are fundamental constants. So n times me times a naught. And so now all, all we really need to do is just plug that into the, the equation here for, for v squared. So if you allow that to be squared, then you just do that. So we can now calculate the, the kinetic energy of the electron at any arbitrary energy level n. So we see that, and I, I will write this specifically as Ken now. And instead of calling it the kinetic energy, I'm just gonna say the energy. So the kinetic energy of that particle, of the electron precisely, is gonna be, I'm just gonna absorb the one half into there. I'm gonna let the m cancel one of those squareds of the m. So this just becomes h bar squared over n squared me a naught squared. And I'm going to make sure I'm not an idiot. Yeah, which is always a good thing to make sure. <laughs> uh, and I like this result a lot because we have basic constants of the universe again. And, and to be clear, that a naught is also based on fundamentally experimentally measurable quantities. So this is not only good because we can calculate this very easily once we know those things, but it also agrees with something we have already determined. Um, so one more thing here, it will be helpful to write this in terms of a more fundamental variable as well, because this is also just a easily calculable quantity once you know those constants. And I'm, I'm gonna make sure that I'm using the, the variable that's consistent, at least with our textbook here. Uh, well, th there's other ways of writing it, but I, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw out um, E naught there, easy enough. So what we now can see is that, uh, let me erase the board. The advantage of doing things from, from basic principles is that you see how it's built. The disadvantages is that 
I, I have to stop along the way exactly as you would if you were doing this, and I don't always know what the answer is, which I actually kind of like not knowing it. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and rewrite this as e sub n is simply 1 over n squared times e naught. Now, um, just to be clear, when, when you actually plug these values in and you convert to the uh, to the proper units, which the easiest units to use for, for atomic um, atomic energies is, as we've already talked about, electron volts. So when you do write this in terms of EVs, that is 13.6 EVs. And the other thing that I'm not even going to try to rationalize is we're just going to throw a negative in there just to be just to, to, to agree with stuff. So uh, I'm glad I censored myself there. <laughs> uh, anyway. We, we do view it as negative, and, and I've, I've discussed this uh, previously. So, in this case here, what we're going to find is that, um, now, as you recall, this is, we do not allow for n to be continuous. But, if n was continuous, um, yeah, if n was a continuous variable, and if we allowed for this to take on any value, so a non-quantum system, the energy as a function of that variable is going to look, first of all, it's going to be like a 1 over n, 1 over x squared, except that negative flips it like this, so it's going to look like that. And then now when we realize that n is a quantized thing, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, now we see that this built up exactly those energy levels that we had previously described by, do you recall, when we had previously described this? It directly came from Rydberg's formula by looking at the energies emitted by the electron, or emitted by the atom. By looking at the energies of the wavelengths emitted, we can work backwards and determine what are the energies of the atom itself. So, we have independently done this now, and this is why it's so badass. Because we have a completely different line of thought, not based on Rydberg's formula, based on first principles of classical and quantum physics, which will now agree perfectly with Rydberg's analysis. And this is where things really start to become really cool. So, this here is going to be minus 13.6 EVs. This point right here where it intersects, uh, and I've done a terrible job of accurate, accurately doing this, but that's going to be, I think it was, um, uh, something. That's going to be something else. Uh, and they get closer and closer. I, I, I apologize, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. But the whole point of this is that this prediction right here, when you plug in these numbers, will be perfectly consistent with Rydberg's formula. And... In the end, um, I'm going to immediately destroy this. In the end, as you recall, the energy differences, and this is from Rydberg, by the way. So, from Rydberg, if you recall, he had said that the energy transitions going from n sub i to n sub f, with specifically n i being greater than n f. In other words, the, da the, the data that he had used corresponded with an electron in a higher orbital falling down to a lower orbital. And obviously it loses energy in that graph I just made. It goes down... Sorry, wall. Um, it goes downhill in terms of energy. So as the electron loses energy, it shoots out a photon with exactly that amount of energy that it had. And the exact formula was given by H. So not H bar here, but H. And it just as you recall, when you take H and divide it by 2 pi, that's when you get H bar. So H, C, R naught. And then that energy difference was, I've run out of room, 1 over nf squared minus 1 over ni squared. Uh, the joys of using a home blackboard here. 
And now what we can do is we can also set that equal to this. We now have E naught, which is that thing, which is that thing, which is that other thing. So, you know, you have to kind of trace your steps backwards now, but that's going to equal the same exact damn thing. F squared minus N I squared. And I encourage you to look this up because it will match that. And it's just fun to see how all of this actually now like perfectly comes back together. So this is the fullest description of not only the, the phenomena that we observe of light and the phenomena that we observe of energy, of electrons transitioning, but the full mathematical description thereof. So this is really, you know, when you hear about the Bohr atom in like a chemistry class or like a high school physics, you get a sense of this, but now you can really see the richness of it because it's a very precise mathematical prediction that is perfectly in agreement with theory, uh, with experiment, I should say. So that's the Bohr atom.